thanks a lot. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a shame we couldn't meet in person, um, but we'll have to deal with the situation. So I'll be presenting work uh, together with Yaisa, Johan, and Che Jung uh, when we're at the University of Cologne together. So the topic of the work is to, to show a proof of a statement that classical restrictions of matrix product states are Gibbsian. Um, so without further ado, I'll jump, jump straight into the setting. Um, and as is customary in quantum information theory, <clears throat> we consider a finite dimensional Hilbert space on a finite lattice. Um, and at each point on the lattice, we associate a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose a specific basis, x, that takes values x1 at site 1, x2 at site 2, so on for so forth. And then the object of study is going to be the probability distribution that you obtain um, as a function, as a result of this choice of basis. So the square amplitude of the wave function in this basis. And now very loosely, what I'm going to call, say, a state is Gibbsian if, <clears throat> if log of p is, uh, is a local operator. So what we're used to, so the canonical example of this situation is, say, that Ising model, where log of p is proportional to a sum of uh, strictly local elements. <clears throat> and more generally, we'll say that the state is quasi-local if the coefficient in front of operators of a larger support is exponentially decaying with the size of the support. And this is a, a geometric notion of locality, uh, not a computer science one. And now the question I'm asking is, when is Px a quasi-local Gibbs state? And the main answer that we, that we uh, give, or partial answer that we give, is that if Psi is an injective MPS, so one-dimensional quantum system, described as an injective MPS, then Px is quasi-local if a certain condition called the purity holds. Um, and I will, we'll go into detail what this purity condition is, but for now, you can understand it as the fact that there does not exist an invariant virtual subspace for the matrix product state. So why might we care about this question? Um, and I, for me, the motivation from the start is, which is one of the main motivations of the many body physics of quantum information, um, which is that, so many body states, most of them live in an extremely small uh, fraction of Hilbert space. And the, the reason for this can be many fold. It can be due to symmetries. It can be due to typicality to disorder, but in quantum information, uh, in a quantum information setting, often locality is the one that enforces uh, the strongest constraints <clears throat> on uh, the type of states that might exist. And so the result that I'm presenting, <clears throat> sorry, is a statement that connects two different types of locality. On the one hand, you have the locality that's intrinsic to the description of a matrix product state that has to do with the amount of correlation that can build up when you know that entanglement is, is restricted to a boundary, to, well, to propagate, uh, to be proportional to the boundary of your lattice system. And the other type of locality is one typical from statistical mechanics, which is where you, the description of the system is based on a generator, the Hamiltonian, which typically um, by assumption is going to be local. And this result is a way of connecting these two notions of locality. Um, there might be some implications for numerics. In particular, there might be some fundamental relationship between variation of Monte Carlo and tensor network methods. Uh, we, we haven't been able to, to take advantage of that yet. Um, from a mathematical side, what is a bit interesting is that this is, as far as we know, the first result in quantum information theory that seriously leverages the machinery from random matrix products. Uh, and so that, that's fun. <clears throat> so here's a formulation of the problem. We consider a finite matrix product state, <clears throat> and we'll break it up into three parts. So region A, region B, and region C. The, the indexing of sites is going to make sense later on. Uh, so we take site zero to be in at the end of region A, and site one to be at the beginning of region B, and region B is length N. So the focus will be on region B. We impose closed boundary conditions on the left and on the right. <clears throat> this is not necessary. 
uh, but it but it comes in handy for the description. And then generic, and then the matrix product state is defined in terms of a number of matrices defined at each site. In this case, we'll assume that they're translationally invariant, so the same matrix at each site. Um, and these matrices are what governs the amount of entanglement that can be in the system. A next uh, object which is going to be important is the post measurement state on the system B. So we assume we perform a measurement on system B in the, in the basis that we specified, this X basis. Um, and then we consider the state resulting from a specific measurement. And this is going to be the inner product of XB with Psi, our matrix product state. And then we project the uh, product states on B. The probability now is given by up to a factor which uh, prob proportionality factor which doesn't really matter um, <clears throat> as a product of matrices, one for each site on B, and then a transfer operator acting on the whole of system A and another transfer ap operator acting in the adjoint picture on system C. Okay. An object which we're very familiar with in quantum information theory and often comes in handy is the conditional mutual information. And it's given by the entropy on system AB plus the entropy on system BC minus the entropy on system B uh, minus the entropy on system ABC, where Psi in this case actually can be a uh, density matrix. And so what we also want to consider is the classical version of the conditional mutual information, where you replace the entropy the phenomenon entropy by um, the standard entropy from information theory. Okay. Uh, now here's the first bit of, of, of magic. And I'll tell you why we care about the mutual information, conditional mutual information in a second. But if you start with a classical conditional mutual information on A and C condition on B, you can upper bound it by the quantum conditional mutual information on the same regions. Um, but where you take the post measurement state on B. And this in turn <clears throat> can be written as the sum of the average entropy of the post measurement state on B restricted to A plus the same thing on C, which then takes this following simple form. And this is going to be the object of study. Um, so from a fairly complicated as unwieldy expression for the conditional mutual information, you land with a much more um, convenient expression, one that has more interpretational value down here. And this is the object which we're going to study in detail. So you might now ask, okay, why, why do you care about the uh, conditional mutual information? And this has to do with a um, not so well-known result of Kozlov uh, dating back to, I think the eighties which says that the probability distribution P of Psi or P of X is Gibbs if and only if the conditional mutual information is rapidly decaying. And is Gibbs, when I say Gibbs here, I mean quasi-local in the sense that if the conditional mutual information has exponentially decaying tails, then the locality in the Gibbs state will also have exponentially decaying tails. And the proof is, is actually quite simple. I'm gonna skip it here because it's not the main point of, of the talk, but you do a double tele telescopic sum of the logarithmic of the logarithm of the probability distribution and you pack terms together in a convenient way and then you realize that each term of the generator of the hamiltonian you've constructed actually is a conditional mutual information and you can truncate the terms without losing very much so that that's the idea but it means that from our original question which is when is p Psi a quasi local Gibbs state, we can reduce it to this much more convenient expression, which is when is the expectation value in this measure, in the measure defined by, the, by this probability um, of the von Neumann entropy of this operator, when does it go to zero? And so you might already, some of you might recognize this expression as being related to the um, localizable entanglement. And it, it is essentially the localizable entanglement, but where you pick a specific basis, you don't take the optimum overall classical basis. Okay, so here we get to the more nitty gritty description. <clears throat> so let's start with the, the theorem itself. So Psi is an injective MPS on a five dimensional lattice with fixed bond dimension D. Um, 
we say if the purity condition holds, which is this definition above, then the conditional mutual, the classical conditional mutual information is exponentially decaying with some coefficient uh, smaller than one in the length of system B. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this coefficient kappa is not the correlation length of the MPS. It's, it's different. And now this purity condition says that for the cross operators, given a set of cross operators, and here we assume them to be translationally invariant, um, if P is an orthogonal projector on the Hilbert space, such that P times uh, the matrix product of the cross operators times the matrix product of the cross operators um, adjoint P is proportional to P for all N, then rank of P has to be equal to one. So there isn't a two dimensional or higher dimensional subspace such that this is true for every single combination of cross operators. <clears throat> and now here's a, a sketch of the proof. The, this object, which was more weirdly than the conditional mutual information is still a bit difficult to work with. So what we do is we use a Pinsker type inequality to upper bound it <clears throat> by um, a type of entropy that depends upon this object P. Now this object P is one minus the sum over the largest eigenvalue of this operator. And this is very nice because here we're dealing with a, a uniform measure and this allows us to invoke a lot of the results from products of random matrices. And that's going to be the main um, sledgehammer in this proof. Now what you can show is that due to the normalization of the state, this P can now also be upper bounded uh, up to some um, constants that don't depend upon the dimension of the A matrices as a sum over the second eigenvalue of this matrix product object and where the second eigenvalue is in decreasing order. And now we're gonna do something which is a bit peculiar, which is that we're gonna upper bound this by the product of the largest singular value of one half of this matrix product and the largest and the second largest singular value of the second half, which, seem, which seems to be a very large loss going from this step to that one. And it, it probably is, but it turns out that to leverage all of the results from uh, the theory of random matrices, you need, you need to work with this object. And it has to do with the fact that it's submultiplicative. And at this point, you take a result, which was um, probably shown in a couple of places in the literature, we found a very good description of it in a, in a paper by um, Benoist and uh, Pellegrini and some co-authors, <coughs> which show that this function n is exponentially decaying um, if and only if the uh, purity condition holds. So in principle, perhaps our, theor our theorem is an if and only if statement, at least at, this, at the level of the function f, it's an if and only if statement. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna avoid the, I'm gonna skip the, the, uh, the proof outline of, of proposition three. Um, it's probably fairly straightforward if you're uh, accustomed to the literature. For us, it took quite a while to, to, uh, to really get to it. So now let's ask, what is, what is this process that, um, that we've been looking at. So the process lives on the, the classical um, basis states where the joint distribution is simply this, uh, the trace of the matrix products. And then the random operator we consider is a density matrix given by this characteristic matrix product. And so how can you understand this at the level of the, the matrix that of the MPS? So at the level of the MPS, what this is telling you is that you start with some density matrix at the left, at the right end, and then you pick at random one of the matrices or one of the um, sandwiching of, of uh, cross operators. And then you, do, you pick another one at random and then you pick another one at random, making sure that you always preserve um, normalization of your state. But in fact, what this is in the end is just a, um, 
a stochastic process which it, which relates to the trajectories of the uh, state in on the virtual dimension of the matrix product state. So you're basically doing a trajectory evolution of the virtual um, space. Or in other words, a wave function Monte Carlo without coherent contributions. So that, that's the way to think about it. And now as an example, we consider, so the, the paradigmatic example of matrix product states, which is the AKLT model. And in the standard, the basis in which it's often described, um, you're given three operators. So the, the physical dimension is three and the virtual dimension is two. Um, there are three cross operators, the uh, Pauli Z matrix, the um, plus operator and the minus operator. And now what we can see <clears throat> immediately is that um, this probability, well, this object, the, 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 the operator with, for which you want to evaluate the, the entropy um, is a product of these matrices. And it, you notice that if you multiply any A minus with itself or any A plus with itself, you get zero back. So the only terms that are non-zero are terms that are alternating between A plus and A minus, possibly with A zeros in between. But since you're taking, but what you also notice is that whenever you have a product of an A plus with an A minus or an A minus with an A plus, you're, you get a pure state, a rank one state. And the entropy of a rank one state is always zero. So this tells you that the only combination of matrices which um, doesn't give you a zero contribution is the all zero matrix. Um, and you easily calculate that the exponential decay has to be uh, one over third to the n. It, coincidentally, it's the same as the um, correlation decay of the state. But now what's interesting is what happens when you change basis. So if you go to the SU2 invariant basis, um, <clears throat> the cross operators are now one, one, well, uh, X operator, Y operator, and Z operator with a coefficient in front. And there you notice that since they're all unitary, every single one cancels out. So for every combination of cross operators, uh, you get an identity here, which gives you a completely flat distribution, uh, which tells you that the expected entropy is log two. Okay, so you go from, from exponentially decaying uh, average entropy to a log two. What's interesting is that this is related to the existence of uh, symmetry protected phases. So uh, there's a general result proved by Dominic Els um, and co-authors about five or six years ago <coughs> that showed that any SPT phase in the matrix product state language has the property that there exists a local basis for which the cross operators are a unitary tensor some other matrix which doesn't play an important role. And this unitary is a representation of the, of the symmetry group, in fact. Um, so obviously it's not difficult to see that whenever your cross operators have this form that they're unitary tensor uh, something else, then the purity condition will be violated and the, the, uh, the theorem will not hold. Somehow information is being preserved across, across the chain. Okay, so that's um, Mike, maybe just uh, just we should try to wrap up in, in three 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 minutes or so, if that's yeah. Uh, well, this is the last slide, so I'll wrap up in, in one minute. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So the outlook is um, well for me at least it was very surprising that there's still things to say about uh, a fixed bond dimension MPS, um, but there are plenty of more settings where where one might um, be able to make stronger statements. Uh, the, the most obvious, I think, is, is the MPO setting. So uh, when is an MPO or an MPDO? So uh, an MPO where you have a promise that it's a positive density matrix or non-negative density matrix, when is that uh, a quantum Gibbs state? You can't quite use the same, the same tricks. Um, I think this could be used as a, a rigorous convergence proof for wave function Monte Carlo. Um, and I, I've been speculating a bit about whether one can use this for algorithmic improvements, in particular in, in Isaac Kim's uh, recent holographic simulation scheme, um, 
where you map a time dimen uh, uh, space dimension onto time and you evolve an open system instead of a closed system representing your circuit. And I, I figure this, these, these tools might be useful uh, there as well. But I would say we're still missing a, a killer application for this. So that, that's, uh, that's what I have. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Um, let's sit there.